D&D number 5, Angels in Jesus' Name, chapter 15. There was still yellow crime scene tape around the house, but Lizzie assured Jody that Nigel said it was okay to go home. Lizzie hadn't realized that she'd been standing in the twins' bedroom, her body violently trembling, until Jody came and wrapped her arms around her. Suddenly, Lizzie pushed her away and ran to the bathroom. Jody followed, sitting down on the edge of the tub and rubbing Lizzie's back as she retched. Maybe this was a bad idea, Jody said. You want to leave? We don't have to do this. Lizzie stood and leaned over the sink, rinsing her mouth. No, it's okay. I need to get the girl's stuff and mine. I'm okay now. It's just, it was just a shock, you know, remembering what happened. She drew a breath and smiled. Besides, you're not getting off that easy. Let's get to work. New scene. Keegan punched a button on his phone. What? Keegan, Nigel said, we need to talk. No, sir, we don't. I had no choice in the proceedings, Keegan. You played me against the middle. You didn't have the guts to stand up for me, to back me. I can't work for you. I need your help on another matter. You're kidding, right? Cantrell is demanding to speak to you. Me? Keegan didn't let on that he loved the chance to have a word with his old buddy. We're trying to get him to spill what he knows about the senator and the possible involvement of other public servants. The problem is he says he'll talk, but only to you. May I remind you that I'm no longer with the Bureau? He doesn't know that. It would have pleased Keegan to make Nigel beg, but he was too tired to stretch it out. Okay, Nigel, what time? New scene. So, Agent Tanner, Brian Cantrell addressed the man sitting across from him in the interrogation room. A slow smile spread over his face. Keegan drew an impatient breath. Brian, how did you come to be involved with a good senator? It surprised you, didn't it, Brian said, not a bit interested in Keegan's question. What are you talking about, Keegan asked. The day you overheard Hartman telling Salados your real name and you had to make a run for it. Yeah, it surprised me. What do you want me to say, good one, Brian? It was payback, Brian uttered. For what? That's what I don't get. I don't know what it is you think I did to you, but whatever it is, you're mistaken. So tell me, Cantrell, what's your deal? The fact that you have to ask shows what a self-righteous SOB you are. Keegan shook his head slowly, his eyes on his steepled hands. Finally, he looked up. Is this about the girl, Brian? Not just about her. It's more about you. Look, I'm not the one who made the bad decisions. You tried to rape that girl, Brian. It was a huge mistake on your part. And though I made a mistake too, I didn't turn you in. I didn't speak against you, but I sure should have. You know that, right? I should have kicked your butt. I didn't. But if I had, I can see you feeling some animosity toward me. Towards me. However, I kept my mouth shut, so what gives? Keegan watched Brian's face go red with barely suppressed anger. You didn't have to say anything, Mr. Top of the Class, Top Scorer, Top Everything Prick. All you had to do was show up at her father's door with her tucked up safely under your arm. You think I should have left her on the street? She came on to me, you know. It was a game with her to see which of Daddy's flunkies she could get put out. I don't believe that. Her face was all beaten up. Her nose was bleeding. Her eye was already going black. Her dress was ripped. Her underwear was gone. That's pretty incriminating, Brian. She did most of that to herself. Keegan gave a short laugh, only it wasn't funny. This man was sick. He'd never realized what a sicko he was. So, because I'm turning in better scores than you, years later you blow my cover and almost get me killed? That's a bit drastic, don't you think? Not from my perspective. Brian, it's not me who messed up your life. You've done that all by yourself. It's you who killed my brother. Keegan met his eyes calmly. It's you who sent him to his death. Brian jumped to his feet, and Keegan only sat quietly eyeing him. 
Bring it on, he said quietly. I'd love the excuse to ram my fist into your face. Brian stood, his chest teething for several seconds before he was able to get control. Finally, he smiled and eased back down into his seat. If I were you, I'd talk to these guys and make any deal you can, Keegan urged. Is that what you want, isn't it, Tanner? You want me to deal and testify against Hartman? Keegan shrugged. I could care less whether you deal. I've put together enough evidence to fry you all. You need me. I don't need anything from you. What they want from you is information on Hartman and anyone else involved that they don't know about. It's clear you had no intention of talking to me about that. Nah, I just wanted to talk to you about one thing. Lizzie, how's she doing? Are you sure she's safe way down there in Georgia and you way up here in our nation's capital? Keegan's eyes narrowed. Brian licked his lips. Now, there's a lady I'd like. I mean, that's a hot piece. I'd do her first, you know, and then rough her up. I don't know which one I like better, all that soft, pale skin, bruised and broken. Keegan stood abruptly. You're out of time. You're going down, Kentrell. So are you, Tanner. I've been keeping an eye on the screen. Time will tell, won't it? I'm not finished with you, Tanner, Brian warned, his tone sugary sweet. You better keep an eye on Nurse Liz. Keegan flew over the table, his hands closing around Brian's throat. Brian's eyes bulged as he struggled to breathe, spittle spewing from his mouth. Four men burst through the door and pulled Keegan away. He didn't stop fighting until he was shoved against a wall, his head snapping back to hit the tiles. Breathing hard, he shook himself free as others led Brian away. What are you doing, Tanner? Are you crazy? Nigel shouted. Keegan drew a deep breath and straightened his tie. Without a word, he turned and walked away. Pulling out his phone, he dialed John. Where are you? He asked the moment John answered. I'm here in D.C. I'll be at your hotel at five with our attorney. Remember? I gotta go home. Lizzie could be in danger. You can't go home. I'll go. Fill me in. Keegan told him what Cantrell had to say. John made arrangements to catch the first, the next flight out, then called Chaz in Pine Forest to tell him about the possible threat and ask him to be vigilant over the women. He cursed when he was told Lizzie and Jody had gone to Tyler Springs. He cursed again when Jody didn't answer her phone. At the same time, Keegan dialed Elizabeth and cursed and almost threw his phone when she didn't answer. Calming himself, he called Jody. No answer. His blood pressure rose. He dialed the in, and Lisa picked up. Do you know where Elizabeth is? Sure do. She and Jody drove up to Tyler Springs early this morning, long before the sun rose. Did she leave her phone behind? Hold on, and I'll check upstairs. Pacing furiously, he waited. It's here, Lisa finally said. What's wrong? Is there a problem? Maybe. I'll have John fill you in. He's on his way home. New scene. Jody came back inside after taking another box out to the van. She glanced around the mostly empty bedroom that had belonged to the twins and then found Lizzie in Heather's room. I'm amazed at how much we've been able to stuff into those boxes. The van's only about half full. I'm sure we can get Heather's stuff and most of yours in there. Lizzie pulled another stack of games from the top shelf in the closet. That sounds good. I'm almost done in here. Great. Let's get some lunch and we can do your room after we eat. It feels good to get so much done. I don't really want to take a break. I'm in the zone. Why don't you run into town and pick up some Mickey D's while I start in my room? I can do that. You sure you're going to be okay? It's kind of creepy. I mean, put the blood stains on the carpet and the bed. I'll be fine. She turned, grabbed the duct tape, and tore off a large piece. I've put all that stuff out of my mind. Besides, blood doesn't really bother me. Yeah, the nurse thing and all, I guess it wouldn't, Jody said. Lizzie taped the box and wrote Heather on it with a permanent marker and gave it a final pat. She glanced around. I think the rest of this room will fit in one box, and I'll have that done by the time you get back. Okay, what do you want? Lizzie dug into her jeans pocket and pulled out the band keys and handed them to Jody. Well, I know you and John are into all the health stuff, but I'm in the mood for some artery-clogging junk food. How about a quarter pounder meal, a quarter pounder combo meal with a sweet tea? Jody grinned. I think I can handle that. You promise not to tell? 
You have my word, Lizzie said as she held up the roll of duct tape. Do you think you could stop by the store and pick up some more tape? We're almost out. No problem, Jody called over her shoulder as she left. Lizzie turned back to pull the rest of Heather's things out of the closet. She hadn't told Jody yet, but she was hoping if she could get the bedrooms done that Jody wouldn't mind staying a little longer and work on the kitchen with her. That was always the biggest job. Besides, she really needed to empty the refrigerator. They could use the stuff in the freezer, but it had been so long since they left, she was sure everything in the fridge was bad. There wasn't much in the freezer anyway, but she hated for anything to go to waste. Her mind wandered to that last day she'd been here and the, the groceries she'd bought while Keegan was busy trying to get the girls out of the house. When Jody and she had first come in today, those groceries were still on the kitchen floor. Lizzie had then filled Jody in on the details of that day and let her know that it was her battle with Keegan that had made the mess. Displaying the attributes of a true friend, Jody understood Lizzie's reasoning and fears. Working fast while Jody picked up lunch, it didn't take Lizzie long at all to fill the last, last box with Heather's belongings. It's not like her girls had a lot of possessions, a minimal supply of clothes and shoes, a few games and toys, a few stuffed animals, and a few books were pretty much it. Their grandmother had made them lovely patchwork quilts for their beds. Lizzie would hold on to Heather's, lilies, and daisies, but roses and violets had been ruined in the melee. Sighing, Lizzie taped up the box and moved into her own room. Taking a deep breath, she grabbed a box from the hallway and got started. She began with her closet, which was even more meager than her children's. Working quickly, she filled the box, grabbed another one, and filled it. Hello. She gasped, her body jerking around. A man stood in the threshold. He was dressed in khaki pants and a yellow polo shirt. He had his hands tucked in his pockets and wore a pleasant smile. Brown hair and brown eyes. He was clean cut and not unattractive. I'm sorry, he said. I didn't mean to scare you. I knocked, but I guess you didn't hear me. The door was open, so I came in. I asked the lady at the gas station if she knew of any houses available in the area, and she said she thought you were selling your home. I'm sorry I startled you. Lizzie patted her chest to calm her heart and smiled. It's okay. I didn't hear you knock. I suppose I was deep in thought. I only mentioned that to her this morning, and that's how it is in small towns, though. News travels fast. So, you're looking for a home in the area? I've been looking for a while, so the lady was right. You are selling? Lizzie nodded. I am selling, but I haven't put it on the market yet. It'll be weeks before the house is ready to be looked at. He frowned. My wife and me, we just had a baby, and she says she's going to leave me if I don't find something. She's going crazy in the little place we have now. Ever since she had the baby, she's been almost impossible to reason with. Lizzie laughed. Hormones. Yeah, that's what they say. He moved forward, his hand outstretched. I'm Mike Abernathy. Lizzie took his hand. Liz Anderson. Nice to meet you. So, do you think there's any way I could get you to show me around so I can report something back to my wife? From what I've seen so far, this might be just what we're looking for. Lizzie sighed. She'd been on a roll, not wanting any distractions. Well, she thought, sometimes things just can't be helped, and wouldn't it be nice if she could make the sale without having to sign with the realtor? She smiled. Sure, I guess we could do a quick tour. She began at the front of the house, moving quickly from room to room. When she got to the kitchen, her mind quickly calculated how much they might be able to get done once Jody got back. They moved into the den where she spoke of the merits of the fireplace and the largeness of the room. She talked about the easy access to the large backyard as she went to the French doors and peered out, remembering the night she and Keegan had escaped. The scarecrow, the scarecrow clothes were scattered around the yard. She startled when she turned and Mike was right behind her. Oh, excuse me, she said, giving a slight laugh. I didn't realize you were there. Her statement was casual, but her heart rate accelerated when he didn't move. He was smiling at her. His hand reached up and touched her cheek. I'm sorry if this sounds rude, but I swear you must be the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Lizzie smiled nervously and tried to step around him. Don't be silly, she said. He stopped her progress. His hand moved to her shoulder, and she shrank back. Mr. Abernathy, I don't know what you think you're doing, but... Well, let me fill you in, Lizzie. 
It's been a pleasure walking around your house trying to decide which room I'm going to use while I listen to your sweet voice filling me in on amenities. I don't understand which room you're going to use for what. He laughed. To do the deed. The deed? I'm supposed to totally mess you up, make you suffer, hurt you bad, or even put an end to your life, Lizzie Anderson. She turned and lunged for the door, hoping to get outside and have some running room, but he was right behind her. His arm snaked around her waist and the other around her throat, pulling her back away from the door. He moved to the right, pushed her face against the wall, and leaned close, his mouth against her ear. Shh, now, okay. Shh, calm down. She bucked back against him, but he held her tighter, the arm around her throat, cutting off her oxygen. His mouth went back up to her ear. Lizzie? I want you to calm down now. Be still. But she didn't obey. She shook her, He shook her hard and rammed her against the wall again, and he leaned close. Those little girls of yours sure are cute. She stilled, not because she wanted to, but because the terror that filled her was paralyzing. You better think about them, he warned. Do you want them to be orphans? Lizzie winced. No, she breathed. Good, that's a good girl. All you have to do is cooperate. She began to cry. Hush now. The good news is I don't really want to kill you, so there's no reason to cry. As long as you cooperate, you'll live through this. Do you understand? She whimpered as tears ran down her cheeks. Lizzie, tell me you understand, and I'll take my arm off your neck so that you can breathe. She nodded her head. He dropped his arm, but still kept her pinned against the wall and still held the other arm tight around her waist. See there? I keep my word. It's funny, isn't it, how we take little things like breathing for granted until they're taken away from us. Feels pretty good to draw a deep breath, doesn't it, Lizzie? She nodded. You're not going to kill me? She asked in a whisper. Not unless you make me do it. Why are you doing this? It's nothing personal, pretty lady. You see, I'm in a little trouble myself. I owe a debt to someone, and once I take care of you, I'll be able to pay that debt. But why? Why hurt me? I haven't done anything to anyone. No, and that's really too bad. But apparently, your lover boy has, and the way to get back at him is to hurt you. But no more talk now. I don't have much time. His free hand traveled down her back. I wasn't kidding, you know. You really are beautiful. And so the rape part will be a pleasure. The part after that, like I say, it's nothing personal. Just something that has to be done. The sobs welled up. There now, don't cry. He turned her to face him and cupped her cheek. Just don't make me have to kill you. I will if I have to. But I swear, sweet Lizzie, I don't want to. All you have to do is cooperate. She let go of his hold on her so he could grab up the tape, and she instantly pushed him away and tried to run, but he grabbed her by the hair, bringing her to an immediate halt. I told you to cooperate, he said quietly. He drew his arm back and punched her in the face, and her body dropped limply to the floor. She moaned, only half conscious, as he turned her over on her back and straddled her. He used his thumb to wipe the blood from her mouth. I wasn't kidding, Lizzie. Do you believe me now? She sniffed. Yes, she whimpered. Okay, then. Lizzie closed her eyes as the tears ran freely, but she opened them again when she heard the ripping sound of duct tape. He had a roll of it in his hands. Her roll. Grabbing her hands, he taped them together. It's not that I don't think you'll cooperate, he said. It's just that it's possible your instincts may kick in against your will, and I don't want to have to hurt you again. He drug her across the floor and tossed her onto the sofa. When he knelt over her, she tried to bring her taped hands down hard on the back of his head, and he punched her again and then ripped open her shirt. My fiancé is going to kill you, he chuckled. Your fiancé is trying to save himself right now. I'll be long gone by the time he finds out what happened to his woman. It doesn't matter that you're long gone. He'll hunt you down and kill you. Stop right now, and I'll tell him to let you live. Lizzie? Mike cursed. Lizzie's eyes closed with gratitude at the sound of the masculine voice. She started to scream, but Mike's hand clamped over her mouth. He leaned close. Gotta go. We'll continue this later. He slipped quickly out the French door. Lizzie! 
I'm in here, she cried. Hurry, he's getting away. Officer Daryl Hornsby came cautiously into the den, his gun drawn. He went out the back, Lizzie said. He just left. Hurry. Daryl spoke into his mic and ran out the door. Lizzie was so weak and dizzy that when she tried to sit up, she only succeeded in falling off the sofa. Lying on the floor, she began to worry that she just sent Daryl to his death when he finally came back inside. Kneeling down beside her, he holstered his gun and lifted her back onto the sofa. She shivered uncontrollably. Did you get him? She asked between clenched teeth. No. We have a manhunt in progress, though. Daryl cut the tape from her wrists and grabbed an afghan and pulled it gently around her shoulders. Thank God you stopped by, she said, her throat clogging with emotion. Lizzie, I'm so sorry. About this. About everything. She looked up at him, her eyes not really seeing him. Lizzie, I'm going to take you to the hospital, okay? No, she scrambled away. No. Lizzie? Jody came in, threw the food on the kitchen counter. Lizzie? She moved toward the voices in the den. Lizzie, there's police everywhere. Are you? Oh, hap what happened, sweetie? She knelt down by her and hugged her close. A man came in. He said he was going to hurt me, Lizzie explained. Tell me everything, Daryl said kindly. Lizzie told everything she could remember, having to stop at intervals to get control. Jody stayed beside her, and Lizzie rocked back and forth, her eyes blinking in slow motion. Jody touched her bruised and swollen face and spoke softly. I'm going to get Keegan on the phone, okay? When she didn't answer, Jody started for her purse to get her cell phone, and then remembered that she lost hers. John is going to be really mad at me, she mumbled. She picked up the house phone, but the line was dead. She headed outside to find the officer who'd saved the day. Excuse me, officer, do you have a phone I can use to call my husband? I seem to have lost my cell phone. He handed her a phone. How's she doing? Not good. She's in shock, I think. Thank goodness you got here when you did. It's like a miracle. He shook his head. It's no miracle. Agent Tanner called me and asked me to come out here and check on her. Said he'd interviewed a prisoner who'd made some veiled threats. I, we, came right away, he said, motioning to the other officers. Well, thank you for that, Jody said as she punched in John's number. This is John, he answered. It's me, she said. Are you with Lizzie, he asked immediately. Yes, I'm sorry, John. I completely forgot to replace my phone this morning. We left so early, it just completely slipped my mind. That's okay, darling. No harm, no foul. She sniffed, feeling the weight of her guilt. If only that applied. What are you talking about? Lizzie is safe with you, right? She is now, but they got to her, John. He swallowed. What happened? He listened while Jody told him the entire story, and when she finished, he took a few moments to calm himself and take stock of the situation, and finally he spoke. Okay, Jody, first, I know you feel bad for leaving her, but you couldn't have known, so don't blame yourself. Second, don't let Lizzie speak to Keegan until he's been told in person. If I tell Keegan over the phone, he'll hop the next flight home. He absolutely has to face that committee tomorrow. I'd tell him myself, but I'm not with him. I'm at the airport. I was on my way home to watch over Lizzie until Keegan could get back to her. It looks like I'm too late. Anyway, I'll call Braden and get him to fill Keegan in. Okay, but she needs to speak to him, so do it fast, please. She's like zombied out on me. Call you back, he said and hung up. New scene. Keegan struggled against the chokehold Braden had on him. He could have gotten himself released if he wanted to hurt his friend, but he really didn't. Beside the fact that Tristan and Caleb had their limbs entwined with his and they weren't about to let him go. He bucked one more time, his face turning red with the strain, before he gave up. Okay. Okay, he gasped. Still, Braden wasn't having it. He motioned for Tristan to bring Keegan's cuffs, and before Keegan knew what was happening, they had him cuffed behind his back. And finally, Braden let go. Keegan flipped over on the bed and slipped down onto the floor. He looked up imploringly. She needs me. There's nothing you can do for her right now. You don't understand. She's not tough and seasoned. She's innocent. She needs me. You can talk to her on the phone. You need to get your priorities straight. Do you think I care at all about this stupid committee? It's not like I'm running off for some hot date. This guy almost raped her. He hurt her. His head bowed. I'm going to hunt him down and kill him. You mean you're going to bring him to justice, right? 
Keegan looked up. Yeah, that's what I meant. She's waiting for your call, Key, Tristan reminded him. Take the cuffs off and I'll call her. No way. I'll dial the number. He punched the buttons and held the phone up to Keegan's ear. Hornsby, a man answered. It's Tanner. Is she still there? Yeah, hold on. Wait, Keegan said quickly. Listen, man. Thanks for getting to her so quickly. Thanks for trusting me to do it. And uh, Tanner, thanks for not tearing my head off that day. Yeah, believe me, I wanted to. You're a jerk cop, but then so am I. You did a good job, Tanner. I mean, with the kids and all. Okay, well, here's Lizzie. Hello? He closed his eyes. Her voice was so weak, so strained. Hey, Elizabeth. Keegan? She broke down. He listened to her cry. He needed to hold her as much as she needed him to, and he drew a deep breath. Okay, I know, sweetie. I'm sick that I wasn't there for you. It's not your fault you weren't here. Please, Keegan, don't blame yourself. He slowly shook his head. In one second, she'd switched from her own despair to worrying about how he felt. He didn't deserve her. That aside, he realized the best way to help her to buck up was to focus her on something else, namely him. Well, if only I didn't have to be here. It's killing me that I can't be there with you. It's okay, Keegan. I just want you to get out of all this trouble and come home to me. For right now, I'll be okay. Really, it's over. Daryl got here and chased him off. He told me you called him. See, you protected me even from way up there. I don't know what I'd ever do without you. Listen, I don't want you to go. I don't want you going off alone anywhere. Okay, just until all this settles down. Okay, Keegan. I'm sorry I caused so much trouble. It's not you causing the trouble, Elizabeth. You couldn't have known something like this could happen. I should have, though. I wasn't thinking. I know what these men are capable of. Even with them behind bars, I should have known. What? Well, you've been a little busy. Finding lost babies and getting shot and rescuing friends and now having to answer for everything. I should have just stayed put. I know you sent me home to be safe with the girls. I bet you didn't realize it would be so difficult to keep track of me, she said, giving a small, brittle laugh. He smiled. She was going to be okay. I miss you, baby. I want to be there with you. I'm fine, Keegan, really. And now that I've heard your voice and I've calmed down some, I feel much stronger. I'm okay. I just want you to be okay and come home to me. Well, hopefully it won't be too much longer before I can do that. Is your meeting for today already over, or are you just taking a break? No, it's over. Day after tomorrow, I've got another day of uh, meetings, and then I should be home. She sniffed as she made her mind focus on other things besides that man's hands on her body. Good. I have a surprise for you. You do, he said, a smile spreading over his face. Her sweet voice was like music to his ears, and she sounded so innocent and full of mischief. He, he just had to smile. Yes. Well, what is it? If I tell you, you, it won't be a secret. Okay, how about a hint? No, you'll just have to come home. Soon, baby. Keegan, I'm okay now, really. You're strong, Elizabeth. I'm so proud of you. Just one more thing. You're going to hear a lot of stuff about me on the news. It's not as bad as they're going to make it sound. I'm okay, and I'll be home soon. Promise me you won't let all this political stuff upset you. I promise, Keegan. I just know that everything is going to be okay. You just know, huh? Really, I do. It's just a feeling I have. Well, that's good to hear. You lift me up, baby. It's crazy. I'm supposed to be comforting you, and you end up taking care of me. Well, we take care of each other. I guess that's what it's all about, huh? I guess it is. Bye, sweetheart. Bye, Keegan. I love you. He nodded, and Braden took the phone from his ear. He looked up at his friends. You can take the cuffs off now. New scene. Keegan had taken John's advice and actually watched the news. He'd been watching it now for the past two days, and the publicity surrounding his being called in front of a committee surprised even him. Jeff's little press conference went as expected, with no surprises, with him attributing the fact that he was still alive to Keegan getting to him as quickly as he did.
He'd obviously been in a lot of pain, ensuring the public sympathy. Brianna Adams, Ricky Kino, and Toby Nash, a country music star and good friend of Rick's, made heartfelt public statements stirring the hearts of Americans to action. They asked the silent majority to make their opinions known. They asked Americans to recognize the honor and strength of a good man who represented all the good, strong men who do their jobs with little or no thanks. They painted a picture of Keegan with help from his parents and sisters and childhood friends that would milk the hearts of mothers and fathers everywhere. And they reminded everyone of the heartache and pain the child trafficking organization had caused hundreds of families. Keegan was humbled. Nevertheless, the committee would still convene in approximately 20 minutes. He was surprised again as the cab pulled up in front of the courthouse on Pennsylvania and 3rd, just down from the FBI headquarters, to see a dozen or so people behind a metal barricade just at the bottom of the steps, shaking their fists in the air. In the air. Their anger seemed to be aimed at him. He normally would be angry right back, but instead his heart was just saddened. Keegan and his attorney, Bill Cummins, stepped out onto the sidewalk as insults were hurled. A glance in the opposite direction brought another surprise. A little farther down the walk, another group of people held signs proclaiming Keegan a hero. A few signs quoted what he'd said in the impromptu interview with the troublemaking reporter. They read, And because you're an American, I'll come help you too. Among the group were his brothers and friends, all except John, who remained home to watch over the women. Tristan gave a thumbs up, and Keegan nodded as he fought his emotions. The entire world had lost its mind. Keep your head up, Tanner, Bill murmured, and here we go. New scene. Lizzie hadn't been able to take her eyes from the screen as the drama unfolded live on TV. She sat in the dining room along with some of the inn's guests who'd become enthralled with what was happening after they disco discovered that Keegan Tanner was Lizzie's fiance. He looked so vulnerable, Lizzie complained. He looked strong to me, Lisa answered. He's so good looking, Jody said. I guarantee you right now all the women in the country are swooning. Lizzie jumped up and ran upstairs. Jody, surprised by Lizzie's reaction, was slow to rise. John squeezed Jody's hand. Honey? Yeah, I'd better go check on her, she finally said. She found Lizzie bent over the toilet. She watched her for a moment, then ran cool water over a cloth and handed it to her. Thank you, Lizzie said softly. Jody didn't answer. She only watched her, and finally she spoke. At first, I felt bad for upsetting you, but that's not what happened, is it? Lizzie lowered her eyes and shook her head. I don't think so. How far along? Well, it can only be a week. Are you sure? We've never been together. The first time we were intimate was only about a week ago when Keegan was in the hospital. Uh, when he was in the hospital? Lizzie shrugged. It's your fault. You're the one who dressed me. Oh, yeah, you didn't tell me it was in the hospital, and you sure didn't tell me that you'd never been together. I guess I shouldn't assume things. I didn't plan on it being in the hospital. I was only going to get him interested and then get him to come to the motel. But he had that thing, what he called primal post-trauma thing going on. Jody giggled, say no more, I know it well. But still, it doesn't make any sense. I shouldn't be having any symptoms yet. I don't understand. Well, maybe you're just one of those women who gets sick immediately and stays sick. Lizzie shook her head. I was hardly sick at all with the girls. Not really at all. I think there were a couple of mornings I might have felt a little queasy. Jody smiled. Well, then it's a boy. Lizzie gave a soft laugh. I'm not even sure I'm pregnant and you already think it's a boy. Well, I'd rather believe you're pregnant than to think there's something more serious wrong with you. Her eyes filled with tears. Even though it doesn't make any sense, I just have a feeling that I am pregnant. Well, after five ki kids, I imagine you know how it feels. I do. But Jody, what if this hearing goes badly? No, I can't think that way. Oh, Lord, I hope this doesn't upset him. She blinked and the tears ran over her cheeks. Don't be silly, Lizzie. He loves you. And well, heck, when you already have five, what's one more? Lizzie laughed softly through her tears. True, she said with a sniff. Jody hugged her. 
Let's get back down and see what's happening. Maybe it will all be over today and tomorrow. Keegan will be home in time to help take the kids trick-or-treating. He wasn't sure if it was because of the capable man at his side, but Keegan felt amazingly calm. Bill Cummins had come highly recommended by Justin Lee, Jason's brother, who was himself an attorney. The man had already corrected the committee several times in their statements and accusations, yet Keegan thought his lack of nerves had more to do with Lizzie's words that kept ringing in his ears. I just know everything is going to be okay, she'd said. He realized he believed her. The committee had been formed with two members of each political party, two members of the military, an FBI suit, and D.C.'s police commissioner. Keegan gave the same responses to the same questions he'd been asked dozens of times over the past week. The good news is it seemed obvious that the committee was leaning in his favor. It made him want to thumb his nose at his former superiors at the FBI. They'd lost a good agent because they hadn't backed him. Instead, they'd buckled under political pressure. During the lunch break, Bill told Keegan that the public outcry by Toby Nash, Brianna Adams, and Ricky Kino, along with Jeff's press conference and Keegan's own unedited statement to Angela Harris, the reporter, had garnered quite a bit of attention. The politicians were beginning to realize that they'd chosen the wrong scapegoat this time, and they weren't winning any votes by going after him. The parents of the more than 200 children who'd been affected by the organization Keegan had brought down had commenced a letter-writing, social media, and email campaign. To be honest, Keegan, Bill said, I should refund your retainer. I haven't earned my keep on this one. Well, it ain't over, Keegan said quietly, but once it is, as far as I'm concerned, you're more than earned your fee, even if just for dropping everything else and coming to help. His high profile. A thousand attorneys would have taken your case in a millisecond. Well then, I guess you're just the lucky one, Keegan laughed. Break ended and they made their way back into the large assembly room. The lights from the cameras were almost blinding as he walked back into the room. He hated publicity, which probably stemmed from being undercover for so long. Publicity made him nervous. Drawing a deep breath, he braced for the long afternoon. The moment everyone was assembled and settled, the committee chairman stood. He began a two-sided, somewhat confusing explanation of why and how the committee had been called in the first place, explaining how when so many men are killed by one law enforcement officer, it always bears looking into. Keegan wanted to roll his eyes, but he remained stoic. His mind drifted to Lizzie. She's sweet and innocent, yet she's a tiger. He couldn't wait to see her again, and the girls, he missed them. He'd been away from them for weeks now, and he wondered if they'd even remember him. Glancing over at Bill, he realized the man was smiling at him, and Keegan snapped his attention back to what was being said. And, in light of our findings, we see no reason to continue with this line of questioning. Mr. Tanner, you're free to go. Keegan looked at Bill for confirmation. His attorney nodded at him, rose, and offered his hand. And Keegan shook it heartily. A few members of the committee strolled forward, casually shaking his hand, wishing him luck in the future. Keegan finally turned to Bill. Let's get out of here, he said. Bill agreed. They hit the door quickly. When they emerged from the courthouse and stood on the top step, a roar went up from the crowd. There were still two groups, but the groups were now quite large. They stood at the bottom of the steps off to each side. There were several barricades now instead of just one, and there was a large showing of D.C. cops. It was easy to tell who was for him and who was against. One sign was all smiles. The other offered curses and looks of extreme hatred. Keegan spotted his buddies, minus John, and plus Ricky Kino, at the bottom of the steps. He grinned and they started toward him. A cop held them back until Rick stepped in and did some talking, and then the four men headed up the steps to escort Keegan out of the area. Keegan and Bill met them halfway. It happened so fast it was a blur. The barricade was knocked aside. Seven or eight men ran at Keegan, cops in pursuit. Braden, Tristan, Caleb, and Ricky stepped in front, forming a barrier between Keegan and the hostiles, but it was difficult to hold them back without delivering lethal blows. They were bowled over. Ricky and Braden were on their feet first, grabbing the irate men and literally tossing them away down the steps, not caring if they broke an arm or a neck. 
Tristan and Caleb recovered and started doing the same. And Caleb actually ran after a few as they sprinted away. The cops still trying to get control of the situation. Bill stood and brushed off his suit and straightened his tie. Keegan rolled from his side to his back on the hard, cold steps. Keegan, you okay? Braden asked. Keegan looked up at him with glazed eyes, which then traveled down to where his hand pressed against his side, taking in the bright red stain that was quickly spreading out from under his fingers. The blood appeared vivid against the white of his shirt. Braden cursed, dropping down beside him, ripping off his own shirt and pressing it against Keegan's side. Hold on, Keegan. Help is coming. They all turned to the urgency in Braden's voice. Tristan grabbed a cop. Get an ambulance. Hurry. Keegan groaned in agony, his breath coming in short gasps. Ricky knelt down by Keegan's head. Hold on, man. You're going to be okay. Keegan peered up into the deep brown eyes, taking comfort in Kino's level of conviction. He nodded slightly, dragging in painful breaths. Braden lifted the shirt to peer at the wound. What do you got? Ricky asked. Looks like two stab wounds. Can't tell how deep. Keep the pressure on it, Braden, Caleb admonished. Keegan's vision began to blur and his eyes to close. Keegan, Ricky commanded, look at me. Stay with me, man. His eyes blinked as he obeyed. Forcing them open, he tried to focus. Lizzie, tell her. Oh, I'm not telling her crap, Braden said sharply. You want to tell her something, you're going to have to do it yourself. Keegan's mouth curled into a slight smile. He drew in a ragged breath. Come on now, open your eyes, Ricky prodded. Keegan obeyed. Thing is, this is nothing, Keegan, Ricky said. You've been through worse than this, right? Keegan's eyes blinked in response. Stay with me, Keegan. Stay with me. Trying, Keegan murmured. His stomach roiled as a wave of nausea washed over him. His eyes drifted shut, and he sank into the darkness. New scene. Lizzie stood in shock, <clears throat> her eyes glued to the television screen. Jody and Lisa stood beside her, and John was on the phone with Tristan. Yes, I'm on my way with Lizzie. John looked over at his wife. Take Liz upstairs and pack a bag. Jody tugged on Lizzie, but she wouldn't move, so John stepped in, grabbing Lizzie by the shoulders and giving her a slight shake. This is nothing, Lizzie, nothing compared to what he's been through in the past. He'll be fine. You wait and see. He's going to be okay, but he's going to want to see you as soon as he opens his eyes. Now go pack a bag. John watched as Lizzie nodded and Jody escorted her upstairs. He hoped what he said was actually true. <clears throat> Maddie, who'd had the girls in the kitchen with her, poked her head out. What's happening? Lisa filled her in quickly. John looked back up at the screen. The paramedics had arrived and Keegan's bloody hand flopped over the side of the gurney, limp and lifeless, before it was retrieved and placed on his chest. John felt suddenly sick. Drawing a deep breath, he put Grandmaster Kino's teachings to work. He sent a prayer in Jesus' name. He commanded healing in Jesus' name. He visualized a happy outcome for the situation and pushed that out in Jesus' name. And then he went to pack his own bag. And that is the end of chapter 15.